What we are discussing by just the title is the deliverance of God's people from Egypt. What we learned from Scripture and, for example, reading the book of Galatians was that for 430 years from the time Abraham got the promise in Genesis 12 to the very day they left was when the children of Israel, uh, that, that's how long they'd been waiting for deliverance. You take about half of that and what we read, which is about 215 years, and they really were crying for it. And it wasn't that God was waiting. It was just God knows what he's doing. Sometimes we don't think God knows what he's doing, but he did know what he was doing. And so he picks a guy out of any guy in the world. He picked a guy who is most angry. He is not anything like Charlton Heston at all. I'm sorry, Cecil B. DeMille. And I'm sorry to those who love the movie, The Ten Commandments. Believe it or not, there are members of the church who vilified me because I corrected the Ten Commandments on several occasions. And, but he is not that docile guy. He's not that, no, he is a very angry God, or angry guy. He'd get mad at God, for example, when God finally wouldn't take no for an answer. Back in chapter five, he didn't circumcise his son and Jesus is getting ready to take his head off. And Zipporah takes the time to, to circumcise the son and, and so he can go back. But when he goes back and he tries to tell them the things that God had sent him to do, they don't believe anything he's saying. They don't believe anything he's telling them. And then he goes to God and he says, look, I told you this was going to happen. I told you so. God said, now you're ready to see what I'm about to do. You see, by a strong hand, he won't release the people, but by my hand, he will. What he did was he started off at the furthest away from the physical body. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, if I can get my clicker to work here. What he wanted to do, or what he told Moses to do, is to meet Pharaoh very early in the morning when Pharaoh would go and dip himself in the Nile River believing that he is empowered by the gods. And since he'd be empowered by the gods, when he bathes in the water, that's where he gets his power. That's where he gets his authority. And when Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me, God told him he's not going to let you go. But what you do is you take that rod. And when you take that rod, you're going to make all of the water in Egypt turn to blood. Now, it doesn't say in the text, but we know from studies a little bit later, for example, we'll look at part of it tonight. This didn't happen in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel lived. There is a distinction. And so he is, what God is doing is, is he is attacking all the gods of the Egyptians. So then the second one is the frogs. When God said, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, I'm not going to let the people go. He warns Pharaoh that there's going to be frogs coming up in your ovens, in your bedrooms, in your houses, in every place. I mean, and when they piled them up after Moses or Pharaoh asked Moses to entreat the Lord to stop this. The land stank. But what he's doing is he's attacking the God of fertility, the God of renewal. Her name is Hecht. And so the third one, he goes after the lice. That is, he causes, he tells Pharaoh to let my people go. I will not let the people go. Take your rod, touch the sand, and it turned into lice. Well, that goes back to the God of agriculture, Osiris, that we talked about last week, in which 
these Egyptians worshiped every God there was except the only one true and living God. And God's going to prove that there's only one God. In fact, by the time we get to, well, by the time you got here to the lice and by the time you got to the, to the, to, uh, uh, the, the frogs, they said, this is the finger of God. Well, the flies, we go back to Psalm 78, which is a summarization of what happened, Psalm 78, 45. And we're not quite certain what these flies are. Uh, there's been speculation that they were beetles, that they were gnawing beetles, that they were uh, gnawing gnats. And, and um, for me, the Bible was very sufficient in calling it flies. Because if you've ever been around a fly, it, it gets warm. I don't know where they live. The other day it got warm and I couldn't get over the fact there's this horse fly flying around in the car. I was like, where'd that horse fly? Where's it? Where they been all winter? And, uh, and the, this swarm of flies came, comes in. And so he, Pharaoh says, I'm okay. I'll let you go, but you have to entreat the Lord. And one of the things that Moses told Pharaoh in back in chapter 8 and verse 28 was, Indeed, I'm going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, what does he do? You know what he does, because we looked at it last week. He won't let the people go. So what, in essence, God did was, is he kind of started off light. He touched the land. He, he got with the frogs that started coming up in their bedrooms. It didn't necessarily touch them, but as this progresses, this is going to get physical. This is going to get to the point, like the flies, flies were annoying, yes. But, verse 31, the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. And this is what I find intriguing. Not one remained. Not one fly remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also, neither would he let the people go let's pray almighty god and heavenly father thank you for your watchful care of us through this week thank you for allowing us to be here tonight for a place to meet state to, in which to to be together and a and building to meet in father we just thank you so much for your many wonderful blessings we pray for so many that need our prayers tonight but especially for Donald Rogers as he fell and broke his hip yesterday and doctors are taking care of that. Please be with them. Please be with Judy and the family. And Father, we pray that everything will go well. Please forgive us of our sins. Please bless us tonight. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. So now he's going to hit closer to home. He's going to make this a little more noticeable. What You've seen, and what I've seen is, is that while these plagues have been annoying and a little uncomfortable, that's the word I want to emphasize, little. But if you'll go look sometime at who the Egyptians worshipped or what things the Egyptians worshipped, this fifth plague right here, they worshipped all kinds of livestock. Now, this is different. I don't want anybody going home tonight thinking that, that you can't love pets or anything. My great uncle-in-law, Jim, said one time that if, he, if there was ever such a thing as reincarnation, he wanted to come back as a horse. And we all knew why, but somebody asked why. He said that way his daughter, Laura, would love him more. Now, she loved her daddy. Don't get me wrong. That's not what Laura was doing. That's not what Jim was talking about. What 
they were talking about is worshiping and sacrificing to all these livestock. And I'm talking about cattle, goats, sheep, the, the most revered animal in the Egyptian world was what? The cat. I kind of got along with the Egyptians on that. <laughs> but I don't worship my cat, even though she'd like me to. But they literally did that. In fact, the Pharaoh would have his cat put down, embalmed like him, so that he could go on to the next world. And he'd have, that's why he had the money with him. And so he'd go on having a pet. Crazy, crazy. God gives the same command. The one thing that I hope you really understand or re-understand is that God doesn't change this. When God gives a command, he stays on the same command. He doesn't change. One of my favorite verses is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. I am God. I do not change. We do. There's so many kids that, that I had at the middle school that they go to the high school and because they grew up and they should have grown up, a lot of them I didn't even recognize. And they get upset with me till they realized what I was going through. And then they were like, man, they felt silly. Well, God doesn't change. In fact, he says in Isaiah 40 that he doesn't get tired or doesn't get weary. I'm tired and weary tonight. I've been up since about 4.20 this morning. Didn't sleep too well last night. And that's okay. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you that our human humanness. And Pharaoh, again, refuses to let the people go. I know God's hardened his heart. And I know that he, he hardened his own heart. But you would have supposed he'd have figured this out. Chapter 9, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the fields, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. The Lord set appointed, a set, appointed a set time saying tomorrow the Lord will do this thing. Now he's already been warned. We just read it a couple of minutes ago. Pharaoh's already been warned in chapter 8. Don't deceitfully practice with the Lord. What does he do? I'm going to let the people go. Just get this to stop. And he doesn't let the people go. Now, God changes the language on this as well. He turns around and he, he, he starts off by saying, now look, Moses, you take your rod or you tell Aaron to take your rod and do the things. Now God says, this is my hand going to do this. This is my hand going to do this. So verse 6. So the Lord did this very thing on the next day, and on the livestock of Egypt, all the livestock of Egypt died. Now, Brother Kaufman points out, and I, I tried to understand what he was saying. He said there were some livestock that they kept within corralled pens, but I couldn't find that. Um, and so my, maybe out of respect, Brother Kaufman, I, I might have misunderstood what he was saying. But none of the livestock of Israel died. And God made a distinction between the two lands. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not one of the livestock of the Israelites had died. Now you'd have thought, I mean, I hear people say something like this. If I could see God, I'd believe in him. Or if I could figure, you know, see God doing something, 
man said to another man one time, if I could see the finger of God writing in the sky, I'd believe him. I don't buy that. You've got a guy right here who's, who's the leader. You've got a guy who's seen four different plagues, now five different plagues. And what does he do? He still will not let the children of Israel go. He doesn't even ask the Lord for relief. He's got too much pride. It goes back to that question of Exodus 5 and verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know neither the Lord, neither will I let the children of Israel go. He's got too much pride in there. So when that won't work, then Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened. When that won't work, God's going to push this further. God's going to go even closer to people. And, and I, I'm going to give you a warning here. Got a weak stomach. You might question why God does what he does. But God is God. He's going to send painful boils. In fact, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, there's no commandment from God. The reason there's no command from God is because Pharaoh wouldn't talk to him. Uh, this almost reminds me, I, I don't want to diminish this, the scene, but this almost reminds me of what is written in history about the time that President Truman went to the, the Philippines and to see what was going on. And they, of course, the general commander of the European theater or the Pacific theater, I'm sorry, was Dwight uh, was uh, Douglas MacArthur. The two men were just alike. Thus, they couldn't stand each other. And so President Truman is on Air Force One. He's on there for 30 minutes. And finally, one of MacArthur's aides comes to him and said, sir, the president is on the tarmac, and he's waiting for you. MacArthur said, if you think I'm going to meet that son of a, well, you finish the rest of it. You've got another thing coming. They go and tell President Truman. And he says, that son of a, will finish, will come out and meet me. Four hours President Truman sat on Air Force One. Four hours. Hi, guys. Come on in. And when finally MacArthur realized that who's the commander in chief, wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall at that meeting? But, <laughs> but MacArthur finally gave in and welcomed the president to the Philippines. That's almost what this reminds me of. And, a lot, and Truman took a lot of heat, I know, when he fired MacArthur, but he had no choice in the matter. MacArthur would not be willing to listen to anything President Truman said, and the commander-in-chief is the civilian, and that is the president. And I know you can read all about that, other things in history, but that almost what's reminded you, we're in chapter eight, of or chapter nine of Exodus, I'm sorry. That, that almost reminds you of what's happening here. Pharaoh thinks all he's talking to is Moses but he can't see who's behind it. He can't see who's going to do it. So this is the wildest thing or one of the wildest things I've ever heard God tell anybody to do. What you're going to do is you're going to take ashes from a furnace. You're going to go in the side of Pharaoh and you're going to throw those ashes in the air. And what's going to happen is they're going to turn, it's going to turn and create painful boils on every Egyptian, on their slaves, on Pharaoh. It's going to go to verse chapter nine, verse eight. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, 
Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh and it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. And it will cause boils that break out on, and sores on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So they took ashes from the furnace, and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward the heaven. And they caused boils to break out and sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians and on the, all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not heed them. And I, I've learned something in in this study. I've I've looked at this, read this for years, and and I love the story. I, I could not figure out. For the longest time, I mean, I know God is God, and I know He knows what He's doing. But why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Look at the very end of verse number 12. This is why. Who was right? Was God? Yes. He's not going to listen. He's not going to listen to anything you say. He's not going to listen to anything you... you no. You remember, by a strong hand, he won't let you go, but by my hand, he will. And so when the magicians couldn't perform it, when the painful boils are there, you'd think that this would have got Pharaoh's attention. You'd have thought he might have said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Look, tell my people go or tell the people to go. But he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to Moses. Ultimately, he wouldn't listen to God. Now, I didn't read. The other thing I didn't read in this was that where the, the plague of the, um, oh, good grief. Sorry. I didn't read where the live, plague of the livestock stopped. I didn't read this plague stopping. It's still happening in, in chapter nine. I tried to find where it had stopped. So that doesn't work. So now he's going to go to plague seven. And I don't like hail for one, for two reasons. Number one, I know there's tornadic activity. Let me emphasize the word tornadic activity, not a tornado necessarily, when it hails. I still to this day do not understand why our third grade teachers let us run across the yard. Probably we didn't hear them say come back, but it was hailing about golf ball sized hail and we saw our parents, I saw my mom's car, and I ran for the car. And I can still feel where that hailstone hit me, right there. <laughs> and I went, oh, 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 it was funny. You know, that's kind of cool. Now I wonder why in the world they let us run, and probably they said come back, but I just, I didn't hear them. I was wanting to go home anyway. And it was a pretty, pretty thunderous situation. The other thing is I don't like hail is we had a wheat crop up in north in the southeast near the southeast panhandle of Texas. I've never seen my dad so encouraged about farming. We, we were going to make about 30 to 35 bushels to the acre. Best crop we'd ever had. We were getting ready to start cutting it on Monday. On Friday, a hailstorm went in and it looked like somebody took a lawnmower and just leveled it to the ground. Tornado had gone through there. Now you'd think that if Moses said anything or if God said anything, that Moses, that Pharaoh would have went, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, now he's gone back to get power from the water. Pharaoh's gone back to worship his God in the water, not the Nile River. And so God tells him, 
You're going to get up early. You're going to meet Pharaoh. And when you meet Pharaoh, you're going to tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart. Something's going to touch you. Something, not physically necessarily, but it's going to be emotional. And if you know what the 10th plague is, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, hang on, we're getting there. It was not Pharaoh that called it, like the movie said. It was God who said it. But at this time, I'll send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that they may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Again, let me go back to my what I said a few minutes ago. Old boy told a Christian if he could see the finger of God moving, he'd believe in God. Well, take a look around you. I always tell people when they say something like that, I say, I want you to look at Genesis chapters one and two. And I want you to tell me what is not in Genesis one and two that's here today. And what I mean by that is something God didn't create. For example, the, the spirit hovered over the face of the water. So we got a separation of waters. We got a light and we got a dark. We've got a sun and we got a moon. And all those planets stay in perfect form. They just found how many more? Well, how many did somebody see? I can't remember how many more moons of Jupiter? 72, I think. I think they said they're up to 136 moons they found on Jupiter. I mean, look at the rings of Saturn. I mean, you just you see that. Boy, I tell you what, I got to see it a few weeks ago through the computer. But man, it was real close to the Earth. And I think, is it tonight that you got the moon, Jupiter, Mars, uh, Saturn, and Mars all lined up this way, I think. Somebody said, somebody figured up. Well, if you started living on the moon, how long is it going to take for the moon to go, go around the sun? Nobody's ever figured that. It's 29 and a half days on the moon that goes around the earth, 29 and a half of our days. <laughs> We're the only planet that, that goes a full year. I mean, God put that into perfect motion. Everything else that's listed in Genesis 1 and 2. Is a human being there? Yes. When Al Gore tells me that he supports what the, he doesn't say this specifically, but he supported what the Forest Service was doing by shooting feral cows. I can't believe that. I cannot believe that they went that far. But if you'll recall a few years ago, Al Gore said the greatest problem that we've got in the world is global warming, and the greatest cause of global warming is cow poop. We ought to kill all cattle, he said. Well, now, wait a minute. What did God say? He created it. And when he created the livestock, it's all what? Good. I do not know what Al Gore is going to do one day when he stands before God. Because he tells us everything God did was bad. Now, he won't say it that way. But that's what he means. Verse 15. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, well, he's already done that twice, three times, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I've raised you up that I may show, you, show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And yet you exalt, as you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, 
for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home and they shall die. How many warnings did we get with that windstorm from the weather, from the weather people? You better go tie everything down. You better go. And, and people, some people didn't. They didn't listen to anything the weatherman said. Well, I don't know where my trash can is. I don't know where this is, where this is. Well, I, yeah, I do. It went that way. <laughs> Amazing. That six plagues have been given to them. And the only people that are listening are the citizens of Egypt. The leader is not. Verse 20. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. And Moses said, uh, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. Now, if the hail's not going to get your attention, I assure you there's two things that will get your attention. I love lightning. I respect, I have healthy respect for it. I don't get under a tree. I don't, I don't get anywhere close to trees because you see, I, I'm from that kind of country that has all that. I, I don't get too excited about it. I like the adrenaline that it provides sometimes, but don't get under a tree, but make sure that you're someplace safe in your house. The other thing that gets people's attention is thunder. And it's still true. You can hear the thunder. You can see the lightning bolt and then start counting how many seconds there are till it thunders. And that's usually about how far the storm is away. But one night, my aunt and I, she had a CB. So when she came up, I liked to sit with her and, during the summer. And I, the lightning was so bad, my eyes were almost like I'd been in a welder's thing. If you've ever been around welding and you, you, you weren't wearing the, the hood, oh, man, eyes burned. Tried to go to sleep about 1230 once the storm was over with and 1230 in the morning, man, just all I could see was just bolts of lightning everywhere. Well, watch this. Verse 23. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. So very heavy that none was like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt. All that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Because God made that distinction. This, by the way, is the longest of the, of the ten plagues. The reason is, he's going to make it even more close to home, if you will. He's going to make it more painful. Starts off, and, it, and they're all painful. Don't misunderstand me. That's not what we're saying. But the closer you get to somebody, the more painful they get. Well, here's Pharaoh's refusal. And God caused Pharaoh to stand for God's purpose. What do I mean by that? Go to verse 27. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. Now, wait just a second. Let's, let's back up a second. How many times did he sin? Try seven. Remember, I don't know the Lord. Neither will I let the children of Israel go. And then he turns around and he says, 
I'm not going to let the children of Israel go. No. Moses said, don't deal deceitfully with the Lord. When he said, you can go. What happens? He dealt deceitfully with the Lord. But he thinks only he has sinned this time if it's going to stop this. Watch this. Verse 27. I have sinned this time. <laughs> the Lord is righteous. And my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there be no more mighty thundering and hail. For it's enough. I'll let you go. And you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, as soon as I've gone out of the city, I will spread my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There will be no more hail that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know you will not yet fear the Lord your God. There is one word in that sentence that is the most powerful, the word yet. You do not fear the Lord. You don't fear the Lord. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head and the flax was in its bud, but the wheat and the spelt were not struck for their late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh. You think he got hit with any of the hail? I don't think so. I know so. <laughs> and he spread out his hands to the Lord, then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw the rain, the hail and the thunder had ceased, he what? He sinned more. He sinned more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go. Here's the key. As the Lord has spoken. This is not anything new. There are people today as we've been talking about throughout the study tonight, there are people today who think that God just can't be that bad. God can't be that mean. Well, he's not that mean. He's got a system of justice that demands a price. And since he has that system of justice that demands a price, we have a choice. If we take the wrong choice, then where are we headed? We're headed to hell. If we take the correct choice, we're headed to heaven. And somewhere along the lines, we've got that enemy who's always trying to put in a stumbling block. And he's always trying to put in some trip. And, 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 his, and his tricks aren't, aren't not always bad. That is what I mean. They don't look bad. But ultimately they are. In fact, go back to verse 34 one more time. When fair, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse uh, 33. So when Moses went out of the, so Moses went out of the city, spread out his hands, then the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain was not poured on. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. See, there's some people that just don't believe there's a day of judgment coming. And if there, there is, there's only one side of it. And that is heaven. When the Bible teaches otherwise. And what is so hard for me to read is Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter in at the gate, at the wide, or enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many people find that. But you enter in at the difficult way. For narrow is the way, and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life. And very few find that. I wish you'd have turned that around. I wish you'd have just said, you know, 
No, it's just everything's all right. But God has a system of justice that must be met. And by the time we get to the end of our study, you will see that God's going to make it personal. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 18 is the first time God gave a command to avoid being killed. What we know is that God is a jealous God, and he's going to destroy all the other gods. And Moses is a foreshadow of Jesus. He goes and entreats on behalf of Pharaoh. Who's, who does Jesus entreat upon <laughs> for <laughs> you and me? But the key is that the earth belongs to the Lord. But he says, I know he will not let you go. And the only way, the only way to get him to let you go is by my hand. You and I have a fight. We got a war, a war we didn't ask for, a war we didn't try to start. But we got it anyway. Whose hand by whose hand are we going to fight? The Lord's. Ephesians 6, verse 10 to, 30, to 20. Specifically 10 to 13. Stand in the power of the Lord and in the power of his might. That's how a lot of times Christian people appear to be weak when they don't say anything in return or retaliate. But meekness is not weakness. That's actually strength. From whom do we get it? The Lord. Whose example do we see? The Lord. And by the time we get to chapter 12, we're going to see that the Lord has won. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we have handled your word correctly. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for all who are here. And we pray for those who weren't as fortunate as us. Again, Father, we lift those up that need our prayers tonight. Father, there's so many that are hurting. But Father, we thank you. There's so many that have recovered from whatever it is they've had that we sometimes don't thank you for that. And for that, we ask you to forgive us. Keep us safe and in your care tonight. Forgive us of our sins, please. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you all for being here tonight. You're good. <laughs>